was investing in Africa. Um, about two years ago, I was uh, four-wheel drive, bumpity bumpity bump, western, to gray. We were looking for the ideal spot for a uh, solar field. At a certain point, people taking us around said, do you want to see the cemetery? What cemetery? And so, of course, you have to, there's, there's not marked, it's not like there's a museum trail or anything, and they bring me to a cemetery of uh, Beta Israel, it's unmarked, um, in the bush, uh, with, you know, with all the overgrowth. And it's like, do you want to see the synagogue? So I get someone with the keys to go into um, a building, and we're in the temple, and there's something strange, because the sun's setting over here, but the direction of prayer was over there, but Jerusalem is was north. And I was like, something was fishy here. What was going on? Um, and what it was is that apparently, at least in this synagogue, um, they were praying east towards Axiom because that's where the ark was. The ark, right? The ark of the covenant. And they were also under Christian rule. So it was a way of um, um, giving deference. So two months ago, we were hosting um, Israel's National Renewable Energy Conference, and my friend Emily was on my right, and to her right was um, someone from Ethiopia, working for the U.S. Power Africa uh, program, and to my left was a powerful Kenyan governor, not we want to hook you guys up with uh, our partners there, uh, who's also a priest, and they're having an argument in front of us in Elat where the Ethiopian, of course, is saying the Ark of the Covenant is, is an axiom, and the Kenyan governor is insisting on Mount Kenya, which I had never heard before at mm -hmm. this point. So welcome to my world, where I, I travel all over sub-Sahara Africa with the Kippah, trying to bring green, affordable power to 600 million people, uh, really as an act of uh, picking up on the Golden Year uh, legacy that we just uh, heard about. And what happens inevitably is that there's a Jewish story there's an encounter. Somebody would whisper, my father kept the Sabbath. <laughs> and what that meant was he didn't light fire. He was the only one in his village who wouldn't light a fire in the Sabbath. There's always a relationship to a lost tribe that comes out. It's, it's really quite astounding how many people. And then, of course, there's, there's a national flag, the flag of Burundi. An amazing story. Two weeks after the Six Day War, Burundi, changes their national flag from the flower, the national flower, to three Jewish daughters. Incredible, because of their legacy and connection mythically of the Tutsis with the children of Israel. I get asked about books for Kashrut. And where do you see in the Torah that you can't make meat and milk? It doesn't make any sense to us. Like, where, show us where that's written. It comes up all the time. There was a side trip all of a sudden in a Muslim country, not in North Africa, to go see an old building that used to be the synagogue. Shh, don't tell me. Like, it's really kind of, it's almost uh, like in, in um, Eastern Europe, uh, back when uh, it was the Iron Curtain. Um, and then the newest thing is there are questions about Kabbalah that are coming up more and more. Really, really interesting. The story of Jewish Africa. Is, is, is at least as old as the story of European um, uh, Jewry. But um, that story is not known. So really, my congratulations to the American Sephardi Federation and Maimuna for putting this front and center at the Center for Jewish History, no less. And it is interesting to note that we, that, that you bring us together on the day that Auschwitz uh, was liberated. You know, hashtag we remember. But we, we, the Jewish people and our allies, we don't always remember the whole story, and this conference is a great step in the right direction towards the corrective. Now, if someone was going to write a book about Jewish Africa, yes, we have, and we're going to learn a lot about the Jews of North Africa, South Africa, and uh, the Ethiopian Jews. But man, the th there would be all these stories of Jewish sovereignty in Africa through the history. And many of them involve the leadership role of women, sort of what you were speaking about. Um, so we would learn about Kahina from the word Kohen, right? A female Berber warlord, right? A Jew from the Jerob tribe that led resistance to the Muslim um, uh, uh, conquest, 680s and 690s. Can you imagine God and God playing that role? Like, I want to see that movie. That's incredible. <laughs> Jewish warlord. Queen Eunice, of course, 
of Ethiopia who, who, who ruled for 40 years. There was an independent Jewish queendom in Ethiopia, a powerful, independent Jewish state at one point in history. That's not in our history, but independent Jewish colony in Elephantine. And so we're going to hear about the, um, our, our friends, the Igbo tribe uh, in Nigeria, who as late as the 1960s and even today have dreams of an independent state in via France, and who trace their origin story to the lost tribe of God. The origin story that I hear to share with you is a leader who sometimes, boom, gets a biblical vision. Second, migration, right, due to conquest, starvation, ancient trade routes. Conversions, lineage going back to ancient tribes over to Israel, and inspiration to Jewish practices that come from the Holy Book, sometimes because of the missionaries, interesting. In other words, these are very biblical on-ramps to our people and our story. And so the Jewish practice of these tribes, and they usually are tribes, they are biblical, and they look so much like what we used to see with Beit Israel. Up, up in, uh, in Ethiopia, which is also very, very biblical. And they focus on five things. One single God, the Sabbath as a day of rest, core biblical Jewish holidays, circumcision and blood purity, and kashrut. Now, many of these tribes were converted at one point, Islam or Christianity, and there's been experiments in some of their stories in Messianic uh, Judaism. But what I, what I see, because of greater contact with the Jewish community, because of the internet and because of trips now to Israel, some of them have a very genuine process that they're undergoing of de-Jesification. I don't know what's the word. <laughs> right? um, that, I, that I really think is, is sincere and should be encouraged. And at a time when the Jewish contingent of the Women's March in Washington was led, interestingly, right, by Jewish women of color, here we are opening a, opening a communal door to Jewish Africa that is going to challenge some of our assumptions, but also represents so many blessings for the entire Jewish community. Now, the American Jewish community, we're really uh, the, probably the most secular that we've ever been, right? And at the same time, Israel is probably the most fundamentalist, in a sense, uh, Haredi that we've ever been. So one of the gifts of these communities, when you go out there and I encourage people to travel, is that we have an opportunity to make room for communities who just have a deep, deep faith and that is non-denominational. They have a love of Adonai, and it's, it's, it's beautiful, and it's pure, and, it's, and as a spiritual person, I feel like I get charged when I meet that. One of the other gifts is, of course, you don't have to tell the American Sephardi Federation, but the, the, the greater diversity of the Jewish community beyond the Ashkenazi sort of stereotype is that this really highlights the diversity. The third blessing is that while we see the weakening of many Jewish communities around the world, here we have, right, emergence of new Jewish community that add to our vitality and add to our culture. The fourth, which I really love, there, there is an authenticity. We have come so far from our roots, right? Um, I feel it too sometimes when I'm with my Bedouin friends, but it's biblical, tribal, of the earth, agricultural. I mean, we're an agricultural people. We're, our holidays are agrarian holidays, and, and they get it, and it's, and it's, and it's, and it's real. And, and the fifth is that my daughter volunteered for the American Jewish World Service in Ghana. The fifth is art. This is, a, this is our Shabbat that I stole this week from the house. This is from a tribe called that the House of Israel in Ghana. Uh, that I've never heard of uh, before. Him. But look at this beautiful art. And those of you who are involved with the uh, struggle for the Aliyah from Ethiopian Jews, you, the Nakoj pillowcases and the Chalit, Chalit, right? That was part of the secret weapon, both for economic development of the Ethiopian community, um, as well as part of the uh, efficacy. And I think economic development needs to be part, of, as well, with education, um, of our outreach to these emerging Jewish communities. Now, in the Soviet Jewry movement, where Malcolm and I and many others in this room were very active, Koh Israel are exhibited that all of Israel is responsible for one for the other. Core concept. So this is going to challenge you, all of us, right? What does it mean Israel? Like the people of Israel, how are we defining that? And how, how do we you know, look at the notion of mutual responsibility with these emerging Jewish communities? I'll give you an example. 
amazing New York Times article about the, the weddings of the Abu Dhabi, right? And that was phenomenal. What the article didn't say at that very time, there was a famine in Uganda, in this part of Uganda. 16 Jews died, right? And the Jewish community had to go from three meals a day to one meal a day. Where was the joint? Where was the state of Israel? There was one GoFundMe campaign that barely was able to raise a symbolic amount of money. But where is the mutual responsibility as we enlarge our sense of community? And who in Israel gets to draw the line? Is it the rabbinate, the interior ministry, or the Jewish agency? Well, I go to the Jewish agency. Right? Because it represents the plurality of our people, the pluralism, the dynamic pluralism of our people, uh, rather than, again, some sort of narrow definition. And so my friend Yosef from Uganda, who's Jewish enough for birthright and for Masai, he's about to have his case heard at the high court uh, because the state turned down his application for Aliyah. Abu Dayah Jew, I think a better Jew than I am, and try to do my part, but... Uh, Serious guy, total serious guy, he's a kibbutz kutura, he's davin there, he's aliyot and everything, and hopefully um, the court will overturn the rejection by some of these more fundamentalist forces within Israel. And so, just like you said in the opening, there's going to be some challenges, and we're going to have to open up, open up our hearts in, in new kinds of ways. And also, this community here, we're happy to open charter schools, right, for mostly non-Jews, in Harlem, right, and around the country. I think it's an interesting experiment, right? But, right, right, exactly. It's mostly non-Jews learning Hebrew at, at these Hebrew language charter schools in the U.S. And yet, we have yet to support Hebrew schools, basic Hebrew schools, educational materials for emerging Jewish communities. So we have to rectify that. When you bring us together this way, there are implications and there are serious questions that we need to um, Consider. And also, let's not put our Meshugas kind of denominational politics, whatever, onto these emerging Jewish communities. You know, like when you do the surveys of the American Jewish community, um, and the rabbi and I were just talking about this before, there should be a category now African Jewish. There should be an African Jewish category. Like, why do we have to put them into one of our boxes, right? Uh, they, they've been there far longer than, you know, uh, than, 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 than we have. And then there's also the notion of the emerging Jewish communities and their impact on public policy. Now, there's a number which, which, which makes us all better, it makes us better as a community, makes Israel a better and more moral country. I'll give you one example, first time it's being kind of said out loud. There were four or five key reasons why Uganda thankfully backed out of the deal with the state of Israel to, to accept forcibly deported uh, Eritreans, the asylum seekers in, in Israel. Some of them were very strategic. But one of the reasons of the Abu Dayah Jewish community is that they thought as a racist policy. And if you have the Ugandan government factor that in to their decision making, hallelujah, praise the Lord. Like, really, that is, that is amazing. It wasn't, the, it wasn't the driving force, but it was one of the key factors. To, to, to make us, I'd say, a better Jewish community. And I want to say this movement to embracing these emerging Jewish communities is going to win. And I'll tell you why. This weekend was my mom's 75th birthday. She was down in Florida, so I came, I came through Florida. There's also Parshat Yitro at Ten Commandments. I said, you know, I'm going to go to Shul. But they I just went to a random Shul in Boynton Beach, Torah Emet, conservative Shul. Like totally normal American Jewish shul. At the end of the boring announcements, and then one of the announcements was, oh, and next Sunday, please join us where we're going to teach our kids to wrap tefillin, calling it the World Wide Wrap. I was like, okay, that's cute. Uh -huh. And then they said, and we're going to have on Skype our sister community in Kenya, where we have sent tefillin, and they're going to learn the same time with our kids on a rap film. And so when a mainstream, relatively, I don't want to say boring, but when a mainstream Jewish shul in Boynton Beach has now embraced an emerging Jewish community in Kenya, and this is again the power of the internet and the power of Ahdut and the power of that means you guys, with this conference, you're really recognizing something and you're juicing it up. Mm -hmm. 
that, that is amazing. Now, I don't know if, if anybody's seen the uh, Shabbatnikim uh, on, on Netflix. In Israel, there's a scene with the chandelier. So I'm going to give you that scene on this one with this up close. So in the great debate that's going to come out of this conference in the Jewish community, there's going to be forces that say, no, 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 circle the wagons, or build a wall, and don't let them in, right? Different wall, right? <laughs> and then there's going to be forces that are going to say, let's open up our tent. Let's open up our tent. Hmm. And so the question, what's the definitive answer of the Jewish people? What does God want of us? Big question, right? Big question. How do we know what God wants? Well, we heard a little bit about the Torah portion before. The hot Torah sings it clear as day. With this, I'll, I'll leave it. Jeremiah 33, 925. The Torah God says to Jeremiah, This is what the Lord says. I would no more reject my people than I would change my laws that govern night and day, earth and sky. In other words, the covenant with the Jewish people is like the, the laws of nature. They'll, the, they'll never change. That is core. God continues to Jeremiah. I will never abandon the descendants of Jacob. And in Hebrew, it's Zerah Yaakov, not Yaakov. The seed, the seed of Jacob. Or David, my servant, whose great grandmother, of course, was not Jewish, right? Uh, Moabite, even, right? Or change the plan that David's descendants will rule the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He said, I will restore them to their land and have mercy. I'll shower love on them. I'll have rachamim on them. This week, I know you can plan it that way. This week, that's what God is asking of us. Now, I'm in Muslim. Jason. Jew, your open-heartedness is like so inspiring that you've brought us all together. And if Muslim and Jew could be this so open-hearted, then certainly we in the Jewish community need to open our tents and be open-hearted and embrace these emerging Jewish communities. Thank you.